Sputnik.com. Greetings, you over one million hellions. I've got some good news. Despite living in a troubled and divided world, one man has brought us all together. And that man is Zack Snyder. Whether you're a normie or a nerd, a general audience member, a cinephile or a critic, whether you're a Zack Snyder fan from the past or even a Snyder Cut fan, I think it's good that we can at least all agree on one thing. Rebel Moon sucks. After the abysmal premiere of Rebel Moon, a child of fire, which I called a dumpster of fire, but in truth, after you hear what happens in part two, is a child of murder. And after the 21% critic score and the rather too high 57% audience score, along with the 31% Metacritic score and the 5.6 out of 10 IMDb score, the cope began. You may love or hate my movies, and I'm 100 percent I'm 100 percent fine with that. But a vote against me is a vote for the focus group version. Right. Just know that. Yeah. Know that by saying, you know, Snyder sucks. Yeah. You're also saying, you know what? Give me some more focus groups. <laughs> if that movie was in the theater as a distribution model, so that's uh, 160 million uh, account or people supposedly watching based on that math. So 160 million people at $10 a ticket, 160 million times 10, that's 1.6 billion, you know. So like you look at the V you know, numbers, you sort of, you can use that rough. People, so 90 million they right now, assume so two like, like, it's like 90 almost 90 million million counts. Million. That's the kind Said, of, turned it off. So 160 million button, people at $10 a and ticket, and like, you know, 90 million Rebel would Moon, be right, people, uh, account. 90 million people. Start the zeitgeist was crazy. So like Rebel Moon, 90 million right now. You know, so more people probably saw Rebel Moon than saw Barbie in the theater, right? Right. Unfortunately, none of the criticism or their ability to use any of their five senses is going to deter Netflix or Zack Snyder from releasing what is now possibly going to be part two of a six part trilogy. And all of that is completely separate from the director's cuts, which are now alternate universes. It's just going to be a lot deeper dive of everything. They're both an hour longer. No, God, uh, a lot of scenes that we shot exclusively for that version of the movie. It's more of an alternate universe. No, God, please, no! You know, like if you were to go forward and make another movie and you were gonna do another director's cut, they might diverge even more. Like it's hard to see, like they might end up in these two entirely different, like parallel um, sort of, you know, experience. No, no, no! Still, you would think, let's give the second part a chance. Things couldn't get much worse, right? So let's talk about Rebel Moon, part two of a six-part trilogy, The Scar Giver. Not to be confused with Rebel Moon, part two of a six-part trilogy, The Scar Giver Director's Cut. Oh, why am I calling it Rebel Moon? I rebel. But first, let's briefly recap part one. After a thousand years of space conquering and recently losing their king, the crew of the intergalactic Imperium battleship, the male gaze, I'm sorry, the king's gaze, gets hungry. Led by Dario Naharis One, they fly through a space vagina and shake down a small village of space Amish people for their grain, which is about enough to feed a tenth of their crew. Those space Amish people also happen to be harboring the most wanted fugitive in the Imperium. But before she can escape, our hero, Korra, no, not that lame Korra, this lame Korra, kills an occupying platoon of rapists, which is surely going to be noticed by the Imperium, and she flees with Dario Naharis too to meet Charlie Hunnam in an alien gay bar. So she can find some allies to help fight Dario Naharis one when he returns. After spending most of the film picking up a bunch of people Zack Snyder couldn't be bothered giving any characterization to, the Child of Fire Scar Giver goes to Planet Calamari, which is rich in resources, to meet Space Antifa. The very hungry Imperium is tracking Space Antifa, and they just miss him as they arrive on Planet Calamari, and instead of commandeering their very rich resources that would feed them for years, they nuke the planet. Then the Imperium, which is capable of interstellar travel through space vaginas, can extract memories from dissected brains, and are capable of telepathic communication, while still not being able to grow their own food on a spaceship, fight Space Antifa on a platform, and the Child of Fire Scar Giver defeats Dario Naharis One, and they think the battle is over. Wow, that almost makes it sound like something happened in Rebel Moon Part 1, which it didn't. This brings us to Rebel Moon Part 2 of a six-part trilogy, The Cringe Giver, where our Amish colony on the edge of the galaxy fights for their very survival against a tyrannical and very hungry Imperium, not to be confused with Imperial ruling force, relying on the efforts of a very small and uncharacterized group of rebels. 
Thankfully, this part two of a slow-mo stupor of a vanity project is shorter, yet it somehow managed to feel longer and dumber. And of course, there's that good old Zack Snyder slow motion. There's slow motion screaming, slow motion battle, slow motion two guys staring at each other on a bridge, slow motion harvesting, slow motion blowing wheat, slow motion guy putting his canteen in a barrel of water. I mean, this film's got everything except for any kind of an engaging story or narrative to speak of whatsoever, an engaging character or characterization at all, any discernible depth of field and any reason to exist. Dario Naharis one indeed survives and is brought back to life and tasked by Regent Belisarius to bring back his daughter, the child of fire scar giver, who he took in after he killed her family and destroy the space Antifa insurgency who's probably planning to block a space vagina. When Dario Naharis comes back to life, he keeps his scar from the scar giver as a reminder after he captures the scar giver that the person who gave him the scar was the scar giver. Dear viewer, you may be asking yourself, hey, didn't the Imperium leave behind a platoon of rapists to make sure the grain was harvested, milled, and turned into wheat? Yes. And didn't they get killed? Yes. Didn't the Imperium miss them? No, because the effeminate male feminist who betrayed the platoon of rapists stayed behind to stay in contact only because he's doing what male feminists do, playing the long game. The male feminist who's biding his time has been telling the Imperium that everything is fine and oh shit, that rhymed and I'm going to stop now. But he did find out they're returning in five days, which gives the Space Amish and our rebels who we know next to nothing about three days to harvest the precious grain. And the first half of this movie is filled with the aforementioned slow motion harvesting, slow motion blowing wheat, slow motion throwing grain up in the air with a saucer, slow motion drinking water. There's a training montage and what we get in almost every film like this is some girl who looks like she doesn't know how to shoot, but she actually shoots pretty damn well. And we get that three times. By the way, shout out to the two-way women out there. We also get dancing, the drinking of ale, and a feast. And for a space Amish colony that said they were pretty short on food, it looks like they have plenty of food. But 40 minutes into the second part of this movie, we get Zack Snyder's worst scene and Zack Snyder's worst film. I wish I was kidding. A character exposition dump round table. And listen, audience, I can hear you now. Why are you being such a nitpicker? Every film waits for 40 minutes into its second part to develop its characters. That's right, an exposition dump that is best described by our friend Mahler. You see, I used to be in a nice place and then mean people came and I was sad because my loved ones died and now I'm in a village defending grain. Every single fucking Rebel Moon character history. We start with the Gladiator who just so happens to be a cast member from Gladiator who's unsurprisingly named Titus. He betrayed Regent Belisarius and was punished by having his men killed right in front of him. How the shockwave didn't kill him and those soldiers, no idea. There's Screaming Antifa Boy, who's also a member of the Furiosa fan club, who's from a small village that was enslaved by the Imperium. Later, it was liberated by Ray Fisher right before he went back to Twitter to complain about Joss Whedon. Booyah. There's Nemesis, the instrument of revenge, who's also from a small village where the Imperium killed her entire family, but we knew that from part one, who had never fought before until after her family died and she put on some gauntlets that were just laying around, and her blood drew on the rage of her ancestors, which taught her how to fight. Far be it for me to point out that maybe those gauntlets would have come in handy before her family died. Her sword traps the souls of its victims. Then there's Tarok, the Griffin Rider, not to be confused with Turok, the Dinosaur Hunter, who looks to be from Planet London, checks out. He's a prince, as we know from part one. His father was murdered by the Imperium, and his mother jumps off a building right in front of him after realizing her plan to put Griffins up against spaceships probably wasn't a good idea. Not a great plan. This brings us to our main character, Korra, the scar child of Firegiver. Earlier on in the second part of a film that may turn into a six-part trilogy, we get yet another exposition dump. Now, we already knew that Belisarius adopted her after he killed her entire family and then turned her into a little five-foot-five killer machine. What we didn't know is she's a murderer and a pretty horrible person. In her flashback, we learned that the king who has decided to stop being a murderous, genocidal, conquering death lord after his sparkling girl Jesus, who is the key to everything daughter said war is bad, walks right into an Ides of March Red Wedding mashup, and I'm sure that's how Zack Snyder pitched it. Then this genius king that's part of a monarchy that's controlled the Imperium for 1,000 uninterrupted years says this. Something's wrong. No shit. 
I don't know what gave it away. The sinister or somber looks from all the people dressed in black with something clearly hidden up their sleeve? Or was it the orchestra with the death bags over their heads? And I shit you not who also happened to be the score of the film. They raised the tempo as the king and queen are Caesared. And Cora, the girl who's the key to everything, who was tasked to protect the other girl who's the key to everything, murders the girl who's the key to everything right after she forgives her. Then Belisarius betrays her when Cora is framed for all three murders instead of just the one. Then the fire giver of Scar Child miraculously escapes all the people with guns and knives. How'd she get off the ship? Don't know. There are a couple of other characters. There's Anthony Robotkins, who was set up to play a pretty major role in The Cringe Giver and didn't. He had a brief conversation, he stared at the sky, and killed a couple guys in the last battle. Finally, we have the most fleshed out character of them all, the only one to have a true character arc. The grain, it was seeded, it was plowed, it was grown, it was harvested, it was milled, and it was sacrificed. When the villagers used the grain as a shield against the Imperium. You heard me right. Today we begin the preparation for our defense. We start by moving the grain into the village so that they can't shoot us from orbit without risking its destruction. This must be some high grade grain, like government grain, uncut. Now that we got all that pesky characterization out of the way, we can now enjoy the last hour of the second part of a film. And the rest of Rebel Moon Part 2 of a six part trilogy, The Cringe Giver is a battle where 100 to 200 space Amish villagers with garden tools, laser bazookas, and an intricate set of tunnels take on the battleship Yamato, a fleet of fighters, Imperium walkers, not to be confused with Imperial walkers, and thousands of armored troops. But not to worry, we have the giver child of Firescar and her mantle in distress, Dario Naharis too. They managed to sneak on the ship using COVID protocols, plant some charges, and blow up the engine, which does indeed look like a reused set piece from Joel Schumacher's Batman Forever. The Dreadnought, which was roughly at 30,000 feet, then proceeds to crash for five minutes as we get our final boss battle, a three-way between Dario Naharis 1, Dario Naharis 2, and the of giver of Scarfire, including a totally not lightsaber battle. The most shocking thing in the film, giver fire of the Scar is actually saved by Dario Naharis 2, right before she kills Dario Naharis 1. And after falling through the ship, having a totally not lightsaber battle, killing Dario Naharis 1, she takes the injured Dario Naharis 2, gets to a ship, and they manage to escape. And all this happened before the ship crashed. The aforementioned Anthony Robotkin shows up late to kill a few soldiers. Space Antifa shows up late to mop up a few last fighters. Dario Naharis dies because he's a white man in this intersectional fever dream. We lost the grain as well, but the rebels are victorious and ready to take on the Regent and the Imperium in the next four parts of a six part trilogy, not including the director's cuts or the inevitable ultimate editions. Oh, and it turns out Korra isn't a child murderer. She's a child attempted murderer because the princess lived. And as predicted, the rest of the story is now the girl who is the key to everything is now in search of the girl who is the key to everything. This is without a doubt Zack Snyder's worst film. And as with most of what he's made recently, I have a lot of questions. Not that I care that much, but let's ask him anyway. Why did the black women of Space Antifa show up late to the battle? Hey, don't kill the messenger, I'm just pointing it out. Why do the rebels look so relaxed and happy? The Imperium is still out there and they have the ability to fly through a space. Vagina. That might be answered better with this next question. How in the hell did an empire last 1,000 uninterrupted years when they travel space in ships that run on coal, that power an engine that's a face puking spaghetti? How in the hell did the space Amish villagers dig all those tunnels in two days. Burrow! Burrow! That's right, you're a lemon. It's all you've got. You don't have sharp teeth capable of biting. Make an interconnected series of tunnels like the Viet Cong. And since the grain in their village was destroyed, why didn't the Space Amish villagers just do what they should have in the first place? Run! If the grain was so precious and it was being used as a shield, why didn't everybody just make grain suits? And what the hell was so special about this grain? Was it co-grain? But at least we didn't get an egregious reference to the movie title within the film. What an honor it was. A scar from the scar giver herself. As my good friend Mahler pointed out, Rebel Moon Part 2 The Cringe Giver should be shown in film schools for the rest of eternity to show students exactly what not to do. And you may have noticed that Rebel Moon Part 2 did not get the special premiere that Rebel Moon Part 1 got. And the reaction to The Cringe Giver is trending down from the reaction to The Dumpster of Fire. And as I said earlier, Zack Snyder has actually brought us all together in one collective voice making one simple request. 
please stop. I'm about to say something I will never say again. As you know, Rebel Moon is a rejected Star Wars script, and despite there being a narrative out there trying to convince us that the architect of Star Wars destruction isn't woke, the same architect who hired former personal assistant to Harvey Weinstein, Leslie Headland, to run a Star Wars show. Yes, yes. I have to admit, with Rebel Moon anyway, Kathleen Kennedy, you made the right call. Nerderotic.com. If you like what you heard, please like, share, and subscribe. If you didn't like what you heard, I thank you for listening this long. I will see you in the next video. Vagina.